Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, January 30th, 2019. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about a piece of the Earth found on the moon, found on Earth. We're going to be talking about um, missing link of planet formation, crew dragon, dark energy increasing, a uh, huge release from Pan Stars, and then like a bunch of mystery stories from Paul. We don't even know what it's going to be, but we're about to find out. Joining me this week, I've got on my screen right now, Dr. Morgan Rainbird. Morgan. I always try to be upfront and honest about my stories. <laughs> wow. Oh, zing, and that's Thanks, Dr. Paul Sutter. Wow. Just never mind. Just whatever. <laughs> and a special guest, uh, Rod Powell. Rod, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Thank you. Good to be here. Uh, we'll get on with the interview in a in a moment, but before we do that, I just want to remind everyone and give a big thank you to our good friends at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. This is the amazing community of fans slash executive producers slash dread lords who uh, tell us what to do every week, who to yes. interview, and we just show up and do our job. So we couldn't do this without you. We literally could not do this without you. And if you want to be part of this amazing community, go to wshcrew.space. They will hook you up. They will give you your, your marching orders and immense power to wield over me and the rest of the co-hosts. And uh, then you can just tell us what to do. So uh, go to wshcrew.space. Thanks, everybody. All right. Let's get on first with the interview. And we've got Rod Pyle. So, Rod, who are you? What do you do? I'm a longtime space author. Pre prior to that, I was a documentarian, and I worked in visual effects on Star Trek for a few years. And basically, I was a guy that couldn't hold a job. You know, I've, I've got a lot of hyphens after my name. But after writing documentaries, I worked for the History Channel for a long time, which we used to call the Adolf Neva Channel because we liked free footage. So there was lots of <laughs> World War II. Um, and that was fun. And I got to do some space stuff there. But you know, you're trying to tell the history of Apollo in 44 minutes, and it got to be kind of frustrating. I thought, I don't want to write TV guide descriptions anymore. I want to write books. So in 2005, I started writing books and I'm up to I think 15 if you count the books I've done for NASA 17 and uh, it's great you know the publishers just you agree on a topic and they step out of your way and say go for it and then the editors come in and that experience is somewhere between well that's nice why don't you change one or two things or oh this whole thing stinks why don't you kind of start over but uh, I love it I did not know that the number had gotten up to 17. Um, I've got two of your books, uh, Interplanetary Robots <laughs> and Amazing Stories of the Space yeah. Age, and, uh, and I really enjoyed them. And Good. what I like is that you dig deep and find really cool, uh, interesting stories as a historian and documentarian, stuff that, that often the general public doesn't know because they don't spend time digging through the archives at, at NASA finding these cool inside stories. And I wish I did. I could tell many more stories, but I, I just cede the ground to you, sir. You um, don't have time. You're too busy doing all the amazing yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's true. I don't have I don't time. Know how you do that. They hear that, Paul? 17 books. Paul and I were just noting on Monday that uh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, sure. You know that you yes, write your doctor. Get busy. Yeah, you write your first book, and then you write a note to yourself to never write another book, and then in case of book <laughs> offer, break open the envelope. Right. Um, and they always come with really big numbers, don't they? <laughs> I don't. I don't what they do they? Um, mm -hmm. All right. So the uh, but the reason you're here is not these old books not the other 16 17 24 whatever it is uh you've got a new book and all i've got is a media kit nice space 2.0 i haven't seen it that's great you haven't seen the media kit oh it looks no. great yeah it was a it was it was wonderful uh talk full color full color media kit <laughs> yeah oh snarky pants <laughs> yeah <laughs> um what's it about well, I had done tons of history and, and kind of light narratives, and I thought, you know, I want to do something looking ahead. Not, not specifically policy, but just looking ahead at the landscape of, of space flight, space exploration, space development, space settlement over the next 20 years. So we kind of set this 20-year mark, and this was about five years ago, so I started trotting from publisher to publisher, and most of them I'd worked for before, and I got lots of, ah, that's great, we're thinking about it, mm -hmm. but it wasn't quite clearing the hurdle 
And I finally went back to the National Space Society, which I've been working with for a while, and I now edit their magazine, their quarterly, and said, would you guys like to participate in this? And they said, yeah. So they came up with some money to help underwrite it. And so uh, about four years ago, started that long journey. Uh, and it's been really wonderful. So I, I guess the core message, there's a couple. One is, why are we going? Why do we want to go further? What are the benefits, especially in cis lunar space, but, but beyond as well? What are the benefits to humanity, especially for human space flight? And what's the sweet spot of this new, this new space age that we've got that's upon us between government programs, both national and international, and the private sector? Because we, as you know, we've got these incredible actors in Elon Musk and SpaceX, and now the traditional aerospace contractors and changing how they do business. So Boeing and Lockheed and ULA are being extremely aggressive and reinventing how they do things. So, you know, where is this magic, magic sector between what they bring to the game and what government brings to the game and what internationals can bring to the game? So, for instance, on the robotic side, I was just uh, talking to Rob Manning a couple of months ago, who you probably know from JPL, chief engineer. And we were talking about missions to Mars, how hard it is, the achievements of the Indians getting their Mars orbiting mission up there on their first try, which is pretty amazing. And um, I said, you know, that was a $36 million mission. And he smiled and said, yeah. And I said, it's hard to do that for even 10 times that cost here in the US. He said, yeah. And I said, so when does NASA and JPL start outsourcing? And he said, well, we're working on that. And, and we're actually looking at bringing their strengths and our strengths together so that they can do the technology and the fabrication and we can design and run the mission in concert with them. And now you've got this wonderful intersection of the best capabilities of both. So if we continue along that route, including bringing in private industry from the US especially and increasingly China, now you've really got something. So that was that was the genesis of the book. So, I mean, this idea of Space 2.0, I mean, obviously this is a callback to this idea of Web 2.0 that you've, you know, that you there's a whole new generation of how this technology is getting used, how all of, you know, for larger and more capable missions. What do you think, when did we enter Space 2.0? Have we That's entered really it yet? Question. Yes, I think so. Um, I, I give a lot of talks and I give a fair number of talks to young people. And up until last year, I would say over and over, Space 2.0 is coming. We're on the verge of this new space age. You can share the excitement and drama of the space age that I saw firsthand back in the 60s, because I'm old. Um, and it's going to be really exciting. Just hang on. There's opportunity for everybody. You know, Unlike when I was growing up, when you had to work for either NASA or defense, everybody can get involved. And, and they're with you, but they're kind of nodding their heads thinking, will this happen by the time I'm out of grad school? And I think for me anyway, the real emblematic achievement was the launch of the uh, Falcon Heavy. That was a transformational moment because here's this big heavy lift rocket. It's like a 1950s sci-fi movie. It's like Destination Moon. This guy decides, yeah, I want to build a really big rocket. He goes to NASA a couple decades ago and they say, yeah, that's nice kid. Let us know when you get something serious. And he does it. And this thing took off right on time. That rarely happens. Everything worked except the, the center core coming back, which still came back. It just did so extremely quickly. And uh, that was an amazing achievement. So I think for me, that was a real turning point because although Musk has been flying for a long time and had great success with the Falcon 9, this was a new level of complexity. And this is something that he'd really been banging on for a long time with his own money, which is a big that's another big indicator of Space 2.0 in my book. And uh, it's a potential game changer. And I guess they just got two more flights approved for this year. So I think that that is, is the, the main starting gun. The next step for me anyway, the next big indicator is going to be when we start getting some infrastructure up there. And that, that's a huge discussion, which I talk about in the book quite a bit, because that's what we need to make this work in terms of utilizing existing resources and space and so forth. Yeah, I go on and on about space infrastructure as as well, and I think that that people just don't don't realize how much having to construct things on the ground, having to put tanks of water on the ground, having to construct, say, even like the James Webb Space Telescope, which has to be able to be built, has to be able to fold up, be under Earth's gravity, be able to withstand the constraints of launch. And, and then be able to deploy itself in space. 
if you had more infrastructure just in space, you could make a lot of those problems a lot simpler. Plus, there are resources, there are fuel sources, there are building materials, and there are communication needs. Like, there's so much that we can put out in space that makes every future thing we try to do in space that much easier. Do you see that infrastructure coming? Yeah, and I think to your point, it's funny because you said you were talking about infrastructure on the ground versus in space. First thing that came to my mind too was James Webb Telescope, and you see how that thing has to unfold, construct itself way out there where it's not reachable or serviceable. You think it's probably a better way to do this. That probably involves robots and components in orbit and things fabricated out there from materials found in asteroids and so forth. And in a world where it still costs thousands of thousands of dollars to just loft a single gallon of water, you know, astronauts are inconvenient. They're big <laughs> bags of bone and meat and water. They're fragile. They need all this life support. They need oxygen and they need water. When you start, when you start finding that stuff out there, it's a whole different ball game. So I, again, I think uh, we're going to see a lot of that in the private sector. We've still got these players, a number of them left over from the Google Lunar X Prize. I was having a little trouble saying that. Google Lunar X Prize, yeah. Um, who are continuing to try and, 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 and achieve their missions and their objectives. And I think there's five teams that are still moving ahead at various rates of speed with, with uncertain financing in most, most yeah. cases. Yeah, and no prize. But they, yeah, but I think between them and the MOXIE experiment on Mars 2020, which is going to grab some, some Martian atmosphere and try and uh, convert it into something usable, oxygen, um, and now you're looking at the very easy weensy beginnings of that infrastructure. But, you know, as you've probably seen, you start talking about space infrastructure to people and their eyes glaze over because it sounds like you're talking about a taxi cab company in Manhattan or something. Uh, it's hard to get across the idea that this is really going to be the big pivot point and we can start storing and utilizing assets up there and even better yet finding them and refining them up there for use, then that's that's huge. So what do you think is the is the long-term sustainable justification for the use of space? When you talk to Elon Musk, he says humans on Mars and as as a Earth 2.0, as a as a backup plan for our planet. Right. You talk to Jeff Bezos and he says, let's get all of the pollution and and heavy industry off Earth and out into space, where space already sucks, so you can't make it worse. Where, where do you fall on that spectrum? I guess kind of in the middle and off the side. I admire Musk's argument, but I think it's a little far-reaching for a lot of people to really appreciate, because uh, as, as we know, if you, if you survey people about space program in the general public, there's a whole lot of what's in it for me. And what's in it for them probably isn't going to be on Mars, at least not for a long time. The the overall settlement discussion that Bezos uh, launches into, I think, is more germane to my position in the book and the position of the National Space Society. We're working with them about the broader vision of settlement. And settlement's already begun. You know, settlement isn't just putting people up there in, in metal stations or on outposts on other planets. It begins with putting up satellites that provide real benefits for people on Earth. So as you know, we have satellites that give us weather prediction, track global warming, ATM transactions depend on them, international banking, GPS, uh, all kinds of transport management. I mean, there's a huge number of benefits that come already from orbital assets. And I think the, the, the really important part of this discussion for most people is what are the benefits to Earth? Space solar power comes to mind. That's something along and coming. Uh, the federal government, I think, put $178 million aside this year to start looking into that again. I was just editing an article about that for the magazine. I think this is our third major try. Asia hasn't been shy. Japan and China are going full guns on it. So I think when you can start talking about things like providing power from orbit that replaces a substantial amount and eventually perhaps all the fossil fuel needs on Earth, now you've really got something, and that's something you can sell to the public. And now you're talking about revenue as well, which makes us all happy. Well, yeah, and, and obviously, you know, the point where it becomes sustainable, where harvesting asteroids, gathering up the material in space is a profitable venture, then you start to see the compounding, accelerating revenue generated from space itself. That, I think, and we're not there yet, but are we close? No. Mm, we're close to the beginning, I'd say. 
Um, I interviewed uh, 35 or 40 people for this book, a lot of them uh, leaders in international space programs, former national official, NASA officials, uh, tons of people from bi private industry, Gwynne Shotwell at SpaceX, Rob Meyerson at Blue Origin when he was still president, Tori Bruno over at ULA. And there is this kind of general vision of, you know, we, they feel we're right on the springboard. There is this stumbling block of who's going to pay. Um, on the Bezos side, you've got a gentleman who's putting his money where his mouth is to the tune of a billion dollars a year of his own cash so far uh, into his company, which is remarkable. I mean, and people really say he doesn't give to charity. He gives to charity. Well, <laughs> so far, Blue Origin is kind yeah. of right? um, but But I think they're getting there in a hurry. Um, so, so once you, you work out this financial equation, then I think the rest will follow pretty quickly. Uh, what are some key events that are coming up in the next decade that you think people should be paying close attention to, to sort of see this, this next pivotal shift into a true spacefaring civilization? The, the the drum that we keep beating is lowering launch costs, lowering launch costs, lowering launch costs. How that's going to happen, hard to say. I mean, obviously, reusable rockets are really important. Um, whether they're going to look like the Falcon Heavy or whether they're going to look like something more exotic is, is an open question. Um, personally, because you've read Amazing Stories as a Space Age and, and liked it, you said, I, I think you'll probably agree that if we could have figured out Project Orion way back in the day without killing a bunch of people, that would have been remarkable because now you can just launch battleships into space without even winking an eye. That's probably not going to happen. Yeah. But, but between lowering launch costs, uh, more robust uh, high energy propulsion systems in space, and again, this infrastructure argument of having assets that you can mine up there and utilize up there and not having to launch them from Earth, you know, bringing back things from space for use on Earth other than energy, I think it'll happen, but I don't think that's going to be a major part of it, personally. I think it's mostly going to be what we use up there for benefits down here is what's going to be so important. So so the lowering of launch costs and the beginning of, this, of the siting of propellant depots and uh, human stations out there. And, and also, I think one thing that gets lost in this argument a lot is the robotic factor. We get so wrapped up in the idea of people being out there and what they can do. And, you know, we don't we don't make good space citizens. I live in California, just north of me in the Mojave Desert is a city called Barstow that you pass through on the way to Las Vegas. And it's a pretty frightening place. You know, you, you go a few miles outside of Barstow and you think that people live on purpose, really. No offense to Barstow, but it's pretty bleak. But that's still better than anywhere else in the solar system, right? Yeah. When I was a kid. Just, just a little little kid in the late 50s, the solar system was supposed to be this kind of green, wonderful place. Venus was a little hotter, Mars was a little colder, but it's okay. We can go live in all those places. It turns out they're pretty darn hostile. So um, robotics are going to play a huge role, especially as AI increases. I, I, I work at JPL off and on, and the, the amount of work going on up there in AI, even with the very primitive chips that we're launching into space now, because we're always a few generations behind the views on the ground, is really, really inspiring. So robotics are going to have a huge role. So that's another yeah. one of those little points. Uh, so when does the book come out? When do I get more than just a couple of pieces of paper? You should get it in about a week, and it, it comes out in general release at the end of February. Excellent. Uh, wherever books are sold. And if people want to follow more of your uh, exploits, where do they go? Uh, there's two main places, uh, pilebooks.com, P-Y-L-E-Books.com is my website. And then I have a podcast, which in no way competes with yours, called Cool Space News, which is on iHeart and uh, Stitcher and all those usual outlets. And it's done in uh, conjunction with KFI Radio in Los Angeles. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks, Rod. Now, you said you're going to stick around for uh, for the the rest of this conversation. Well, I'm so, going to listen to you smart guys talk about, about astronomical things feel, and learn something. Feel free to jump in at any point and, uh, and, and jump into the conversation. They really, the, the level of sarcasm needs to increase. So whatever you can do to, <laughs> I'll do to, my best. to bring it, that would be great. Okay. Amen to that. <laughs> exactly. That's, Amen, that's brother. What, that's what Paul's been looking for all his life. All right. Uh, but first, mm. Morgan, tell us about this story that you stole from Kimberly. Yes, this is a great story put together by Kimberly about rocks that came from the moon, but maybe not. Uh, the six Apollo missions to the surface of the moon brought back hundreds of kilograms of moon rocks. 
And for the last 50 years, scientists have been slowly sort of cracking them open and chipping pieces off and analyzing them with our ever increasing uh, suite of lab instruments to figure out what the heck is going on inside of them. Uh, and in this one particular rock that was picked up by the Apollo 14 crew, uh, a team of scientists found a pair of bits of mineral called zircons. And zircons are really, really important in geology uh, because they're some of the hardest minerals uh, that form in common rocks. And so they'll form billions of years ago when a rock is first forming out of magma. And then as that rock gets pulverized up and turns into a sedimentary rock or turned into a metamorphic rock, those zircons persist. And so they're like markers of when the original rocks were formed and they trap in little bits of uranium and other radioactive elements that can help us date them. And so we can look and see when this zircon formed. And then based on the shape of it, the crystal structure, we can understand other bits of information about how it formed, like what the pressure was, what the temperature was, uh, what the uh, other chemical environment around it was. And they're like little tiny time capsules of early solar system history scattered throughout basically every rock that you can pick up. Uh, and so they chipped off this piece of a rock called Big Bertha from uh, Apollo 14. And they found a couple of zircons. And the pressure and temperature signatures of these zircons are really, really weird for things you find on the moon. Uh, in fact, the pressure in particular suggests that this rock must have formed like almost 200 kilometers under the lunar surface and then somehow ended up on the surface. And even the most powerful impacts during the most violent part of the solar system's history probably only excavated material down to like 50 or 60 or 70 kilometers, not 200. And so there's not really a good way for that to have happened. Conversely, if you formed those little bits of zircon on Earth, they would have only had to form about 20 kilometers under the surface to have those same temperature and pressure conditions. And that's because the Earth is much more massive. And so it's generating a lot more pressure at a lower depth into the surface. And uh, 10 or 20 kilometers into the surface is definitely a place where you could be excavating material during some of the really large impacts. Like for example, the one that formed the, the, or killed the dinosaurs. And so the hypothesis here is that these rocks formed on Earth a long, long, long time ago, like maybe 4 billion years ago. These could be some of the oldest rocks we've ever examined from Earth. And then during one of these giant impacts during the late heavy bombardment, they would have been excavated from 20 kilometers underneath the Earth's surface, thrown out into space, and eventually they would have plopped down and landed on the moon where they eventually got sucked in and incorporated into the next generation of lunar rocks, only to be picked up four billion years later by the Apollo astronauts and brought back to Earth. And if this is true, and like many things four billion years ago in geology, it's always kind of hard to nail down for sure that this is what had to have happened. But if this is what happened, this is an amazing find uh, to, to just sort of pick up rock on the moon and by dumb luck, it's got bits of earth in it is it's just incredible um unless it's not dumb luck what do you mean divine providence right? what no like like maybe there's lots of earth sprinkled around yeah well yeah. that's yeah right yeah. that's what it probably means and that's just as exciting it means and it's not shocking to us we know there's all sorts of lunar meteorites here on earth and we would expect the process to work in reverse as well. The Earth's been beat up over the last few billion years. And some of those impacts would have thrown stuff into space and some of that would have fallen on the moon. And so we've always kind of thought that there must be Earth meteorites all over the moon's surface. But I think never sort of assumed that we'd be able to pick one up. Because even if they're very common, imagine just picking up 10 rocks from all over Earth and one of them happens to have a bit of a lunar meteorite in it. That, that's pretty pretty rare. Um, so, so are they thinking this is necessarily something that happened long after lunar formation or very early in its history? So my understanding is, is that the energies to blast this from 20 kilometers underneath the surface uh, were most common during the part of the solar system's history we call the late heavy bombardment, which is when the Earth, for 
and every other body in the solar system was getting blasted by all sorts of big rocks. And so there's like no guarantee that it had to happen there, but by far that would have been the most likely time to excavate something from 20 kilometers under the Earth's surface. Um, one of the things that, that's interesting, uh, the researchers were saying, like during that period, there were craters formed on the Earth that were thousands of kilometers across. Wow. Uh, so while the Chicxulub, for example, is, an only, is a mere 160 kilometer impact site. So, uh, so that there were impacts during that time that were dramatically bigger than anything. And we can see that the remnants of that on the moon, the South Pole yeah. Aitken Basin is a 2000 kilometer impact crater. You could basically fit North America in this impact crater. And that probably happened during this same period of time, but just never got erased from the moon like the Earth's did. And one of the things that I found really interesting as well was the the interesting story that they told about this rock. It's not just as simple as it crystallized on the Earth, was scooped up by a gigantic impact and made its way to the moon, but in fact made its way to the moon, was driven into the moon, and then was then was excavated out of the moon, probably multi, as part of multiple impacts because the way this material is, they they call these things breccias. We were arguing about the the term, um, yes. but it's, but essentially you get a you know you get lunar material that gets mashed together, blown apart, melted together, blown apart, melted together. You can get these kind of Frankenstein moon rocks that have gone through this process multiple multiple times. And they were able to tell that, in fact, most recently, it was probably excavated and plopped onto the lunar surface during a fairly recent event that was a, a very small, like about 30 million years ago, and it's a fairly small crater that's, that's left over. So it, that, that rock has seen some things. Mm -hmm. so kind of to Paul's point, like... we have a chance here to, to kind of figure out how common these events are. Because one of the neat things about the Apollo program is that the locations where they landed were pretty evenly distributed across the, the near side of, of the moon. And they picked up rocks all over their landing sites in different geological contexts. And so if in the next century we find more of these zircons in other rocks collected by the Apollo astronauts, then we'll be able to sort of calculate number of rocks divided into the number of times we find Earth rock inside them to get a sense of, well, what fraction of lunar rocks are made up of Earth bits. And that's actually would be a really interesting thing to know because it would tell us with some specificity the rate at which these large impacts, the only kind that can really blast material up onto the moon were happening in the early solar system. And, and that's kind of a hard number to nail down uh, in, in other ways. And can I just imagine if you could get access to hundreds of these fragments from different ages, you could chart a period of the Earth's history that so far to this point has completely eluded now, these geologists. These are some of the oldest Earth rocks, maybe the oldest, the Earth, oldest rocks Earth rock ever yeah. found. And the moon could just sort of be like a mausoleum for these bits of Earth that if they were on Earth, would have been subducted back into the ocean and reprocessed, you know, many, many times and, and never survived. So what we need is a vibrant space 2.0 uh, space infrastructure to gather hundreds more uh, samples from the surface of the moon. Thanks for that commercial. <laughs> Much appreciated. No problem. No problem. And I'm still blown away that you pronounce Chicxulub because I've been trying to figure out I, I actually went online, you know, how you click on those things. How is this word pronounced? And I got about seven different pronunciations, and I thought, okay, I give up. I'll just write it. Yeah, I, enough. I can't guarantee that I'm saying it correctly. But I, it's it's sort of like how it works with, with uh, Pluto's moon, yeah. right? I don't know how to pronounce it, but I figure if I pronounce it the same way that Alan Stern does, that's good enough. That's covered for good enough. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Sharon. That's That's all I know. Paul, what have you got? Surprise me. All right, so let's talk about the big rip, which is I'm so super excited. Hot. I know, hotter than a Chipotle pepper it is, is on. Um, so the, the universe is expanding, check. 
the expansion of the universe is accelerating check we call that dark energy now we have no idea what dark energy is or about or why or what's causing it the simplest explanation we have for dark energy it is is that it is simply a constant of nature that the, it is a fun it is built into our universe it, it appears in the equations of general relativity as a constant so it's just constant we call it the cosmological constant it's just yeah the our yes. universe was was born to move and uh nobel prizes this, for everyone no no we've already given away nobel prizes and, and this is not a satisfactory explanation at all yeah but if it's all the available evidence where it appears that the strength, the amount of dark energy has remained the same throughout the history of the universe, that it hasn't evolved, it hasn't changed, it's not different from place to place, it's always the same. It really is a constant throughout the cosmos, hence a cosmological constant. We have probes of dark energy. We're trying to measure the expansion history of the universe to look at this accelerated expansion. Uh, we have supernova. We have the growth of structures. We have the cosmic microwave background. And now with a new paper coming out, there is using uh, quasars, these very, very distant galaxies uh, in the very young universe to try to get at the expansion history in that epoch. And the researchers used a bunch of uh, quasars, did some fancy analysis, and they got a number that maybe points to a evolving dark energy that maybe it wasn't so constant in the past. Maybe it's a little bit different than it was in the past. And so maybe it's not a constant. Maybe it's something else. We're not exactly sure. This idea of of using quasars. I mean, we know that they use type 1A supernova. And that's how they made the discovery in the first place of dark energy. They use type 1A supernova, chart yeah. them out through the billions of years of the universe's history. You've got a standard amount of explosion, and you can tell how far away they are. Mm -hmm. Have people not used quasars before as standard candles? I mean, is that kind of the the magic of, of what they're just talking about is that they developed a technique to match up, to, to, to figure out how to know how far away a quasar is? Yeah, that is always, that is the trickiest part is when you look at something and it has a certain amount of brightness, is it bright because it's bright or bright because it's close? Or is it dim because it's far or dim because it's just dim? If you know its true brightness, its intrinsic brightness, then you can compare that to the brightness you see and do a little bit of math and get a distance. Uh, these are called standard candles. So if there's an object or a thing out there with a known brightness, like a type 1A supernova, you can calculate distances to them. Quasars have all sorts of different brightnesses, all sorts of different uh, shapes and sizes and whatnots. So this is really the meat of the paper and whether the result will hold up is do you really know how bright those quasars are right and it, 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 yeah and their and their method was you know they looked at uh the sloan digital scars sloan digital sky survey to get the ultraviolet numbers and they looked at the xmm newton and the chandra x-ray observatory to get the x-rays and apparently there is this ratio between the amount of that the ultraviolet is blasting out of the supermassive black hole the accretion disk it's bouncing off of the clouds near the black hole and it is releasing a very specific ratio of x-rays compared to the amount of ultraviolet radiation that's being released mm -hmm. by the accretion disk. That's pretty great, right? This is new. This is this, you know, that that's exciting. This, this is, a, this is an existing technique. It's just now, uh, these researchers are claiming again, this is just the first paper on this, right? It's getting a lot of scrutiny. Yes. That, Based on that, they can really pin down the true brightness of, of the quasars using that technique. 
you know, where all the understanding and all the uncertainty of, you know, the astrophysics and the propagation of the light and all that uh, are small enough and understood enough that you can get this very, very precise cosmological measurement. So what are the implications? Let's say, I mean, obviously we can say maybe they did a bad job of measuring. They, maybe they did a bad job of, of maybe this technique won't work and there's dust in the way. There's always dust. Dust is always at fault. But, but what if they're right? What if, what are the implications if in fact dark right. energy so is Right, so if changing? it holds up, if it holds up and dark energy has not stayed constant over time, then we know it's not a cosmological constant, that it's not just a, a, a bare fact of the universe, that there is something dynamic going on, that there is something, whatever is responsible for dark energy, whatever is responsible for the accelerated expansion is a dynamic living entity that changes with time. This points more in the direction of it being something like an evolving field that permeates space-time. Maybe that field communicates with dark matter or normal matter in some funky way. We don't know. Uh, but that would be huge because at this point, we simply don't understand dark energy basically at all. And if there's Did something... their numbers say it was bigger in the past or smaller in the past? Oh, I honestly forget. I think they say it, it was, they say it was uh, in, they say it was increasing. It's increasing, so it's weaker in the past. Yeah, it's getting stronger, it's stronger with, time. Into, with time. But I mean, this this solves two problems, right? I mean, well, okay, it solves one problem, which is the Hubble constant paradox, or helps provide a direction at that, which is, you know, there's two methods to determine the the right. expansion rate of the universe. If in, if in fact that expansion rate has been changing, now you have an explanation for that. They mention that in in the paper, but the other one, of course, is the sort of horrible existential crisis that we now have to face for the future of the universe we thought we had trillions of years now we just have tens of billions yes if dark energy is increasing with time then the acceleration won't stay constant the acceleration itself will accelerate which means the repulsive force of this thing can overwhelm gravity and all other forces at all scales where you're not just talking about pulling galaxies away from each other you're talking about ripping apart galaxies themselves you're talking about ripping apart solar systems and planets and people and even atoms and that happens you know sometime within the next few billion years nice so it's so not like it, nice at all. It's, it, is, it's, it is actually horrible. It's actually, it's actually horrible. horrible. Yeah, I know. I was reading this news. It was funny. I was reading this news and I was sitting on the couch beside my wife and she was like, you're really upset about this, aren't you? I'm like, no, no, no. It's, I'm sure it'll be wrong. I, we've got a Google years. We don't have 80 billion. We'll be fine. But so. think about the, the interim phase. You know, as, as we get older, we all seem to love to move away from other people and go out and find our little cabin in the wilderness. <laughs> Hey, kid, get off my lawn. Now's our chance. I mean, for the next couple billion years, we just get to move away from everybody. So until the big ending, we're in good yeah. shape. Until our cabin is torn apart at an atomic level. Well, yeah, but it's, you're such a pessimist. I know. <laughs> but here you are. You know, I come to talk to you guys about space flight. You start messing with the constants. Next, somebody, one of you is going to say, yeah. hey, the speed of light's wrong. We just found out at 14 miles an hour. And then I got to get upset. <laughs> Through rubidium. Um, Paul, uh, is it possible that it's like, I mean, I guess, I mean, everyone's got a theory, right? Every theorist has a theory to, to, to and many of them have considered this idea that, that the, the amount of dark energy is changing. Um, it could be accelerating, but you could be cyclical too. It could lead to a big crunch. There's all kinds of possibilities, right? I mean, it, it, it's whatever is responsible for dark energy is its own thing. We're not in control of it. It could transform itself. It could reverse course. It all depends on, on what it is. And if there's a hint here that di dark energy is dynamic and that turns out to be true, uh, that's a big hint because that narrows down our possibilities of what dark energy really could be. Stay tuned. Yeah. All right. Uh, I, I have a feeling it won't last long, but well, that, that's I can see it in your eyes, right? That's your gut. Your gut is that that this is going to be picked apart, and it's probably not going to hold. Why do you yeah. think that? 
because uh, if it's interesting, it's probably wrong. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like the bicep two confirmation of of uh, primordial yeah, gravitational like waves. Science. It's like all of science. Like this is great, and it's wrong. Wrong. Yeah. Okay. Well, then that's good. That gives gives us hope. Like either we have a dramatic overturning of physics as we know it, and Nobel prizes all around, or we get to exist for a Google years. Both are an upside. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'll take it. All right. All right, so before we move on to another story, uh, I just want to tell everyone that it's time for a much, much, much bigger hard drive. So um, let's see if I can find my post here. Yeah. So thanks to the, let's see, Panstars, they just released a 1.6 petabyte release of data. And so it's a it's the entire sky. Kind of, we talked about the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. It is like is the entire sky uh, using a 1.8 meter telescope with a really fast camera, and they just took four years to take a picture of every single part of the sky that they could. Oh, Twelve pictures. times, five filters. It is a like I said, it's a 1.6 petabytes of data. What's in there? Uh, asteroids, comets, Kuiper Belt objects, supernovae, uh, quasars, you name it, you'll be able to find it in there. And now it's just a matter of being able to really... I've got an unlimited data plan now. So I was thinking... Oh, nice. I, yeah, I was Let's thinking, test that. I was thinking, test yeah, it. I think I'll just like download the whole thing and just start running gigantic database queries on it. So uh, we'll, we'll get right on that. So, so, But it's freely available to the public... And, and I think, you know, for those of you who are considering a field in astronomy, my recommendation is always also consider a field in computer science. Yeah, if that's for sure. Because all really all astronomy now is computer science. And even if that astronomy thing doesn't pan out, then you can always get a, like a some crappy job at Google or you making know, tons of making money. yeah at amazon.com and making hundreds of thousands of your dollars a year consolation money yeah it's your con yeah so you weren't able to make it in the field of astronomy just going to computer science but yeah amazing you're going to see tons and tons and tons of discoveries made and this is like this new era that we're seeing i wouldn't call it space 2.0 but i maybe astronomy 2.0 that we're seeing this time of that surveys are the way that instead of booking time on the Hubble Space Telescope, you'll just dig through all of the data on the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope and, and various surveys to find the kinds of answers that you're looking for. And then always do follow-up observations. TESS is going to just tell us where all the planets are, and then it's your job to follow up and, and find out what kinds of planets they are. So I think uh, this is just more in that realm, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that into the future. So as A.V. Scott and Flower is saying in the chat, learn to code. Learn to code. Databases Learn are code, fun. solve all your problems. <laughs> uh, Morgan, have you got another one for us? Yeah, the 21st century has sort of been the time of the expanding solar system, where we're finding more and more things out there, uh, especially out past the orbit of Neptune in what we call the Kuiper Belt. Uh, but so far, most of those objects have had uh, something in common, which is they've all been pretty big. Most of the Kuiper Belt objects that we found have been hundreds of kilometers across. Uh, and even uh, 2014 MU69, visited by New Horizons, was tens of kilometers across. Uh, but if we think of the Kuiper Belt as being kind of like the asteroid belt, but farther away, the asteroid belt tells us that there are going to be many, many more small objects than big ones. Uh, of course, the trouble is, is that a small thing really far away from the sun is very hard to find. It doesn't reflect very much light. These objects are often quite dark. They're really, really tough to find. Uh, the other thing the 21st century has been great at is finding exoplanets. And we found these exoplanets uh, not by looking for light from them directly, but by looking for how they interfere with the light of really bright things like stars. Uh, and this was a really, really cool uh, piece of work that found a Kuiper Belt object that's just 1.3 kilometers across. And they did it by watching the object pass in front of background stars and dim them out in the same way that we find exoplanets. 
And so this is the first object of this sort of small intermediate size that we found. And there's probably like trillions of them in, in the Kuiper belt, but we're only ever gonna find them kind of through this dumb luck approach because they're just too small to reflect enough light to be seen even by telescopes that are 10 times bigger than what we have now. But we can see them blocking out just momentarily the light of these other stars. And, and what's so cool about this is that you don't need a big telescope to do this. This was a, a little project that used two telescopes that were each uh, 28 centimeters across. Uh, and these are, these are telescopes that like any of us could own. And they set these up with very careful photometers, which measure changes in brightness. And they recorded uh, thousands of stars over the course of 60 hours. And then they wrote their computer code and mined these uh, star brightnesses for unexpected changes. Uh, and because this sort of worked so easily, they found a tiny object in 60 hours of data with two tiny telescopes. Like this could be a huge opportunity to find a lot more of, of these things by just putting up more tiny telescopes and looking at more parts of the sky and taking more data. And it do, you don't need time on Keck or the extremely large telescope or something to do this. The, the research team uh, sort of cutely points out that their budget for this was 0.3% that of a normal large telescope operating for the same period of time. <laughs> Uh, and that's just great, right? This is stuff like almost amateurs yeah. could be doing. Yeah. And we don't need to did find these things to understand point? the distribution. Did they get their first data point uh, just by serendipity and then by continuing to look, see it block out a second star and a third so they could actually... They only, I think they only saw it block one star. And that's oh, okay. just kind of how these things are going to work. So one star disappears and you know something's there, but you don't know... And you can tell how big it is based on the amount of light that is blocked. But you don't know like which way it's going or how fast it's moving. And again, this kind of mirrors what we see in the world of exoplanets, where the way we find the very, very smallest exoplanets is through microlens opportunities, where we see uh, a planet bend the light of, of another star. But those things happen basically randomly, and those objects can never be seen again. But what we can do is build up a statistical understanding of how many one kilometer objects are there, how many two kilometer objects are there. And that will tell us about the physics that formed the Kuiper belt. And the Kuiper belt's the leftover remains of the birth of the solar system. And so if we know how many one kilometer objects there are compared to a hundred, then we know the distribution of material that went into making planets like Earth. And that's a hard number to get any other way. And when you think about how small that object was, smaller than than the smallest moons that have been found around Jupiter, Saturn, like it's tiny. Yeah, this is amazing. This yeah. is just Ooh, incredible. Baby. Yeah. Uh, well, so we're reaching the end of the show, so I don't. We don't need to dig into Paul's uh, grab bag of uh, of other mystery stories today. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll save it for next week um, but, uh, but before we go I would love to give my co-hosts a chance to tell us something interesting that they're working on Paul, you're on my screen right now what are you working on? Hey, let's all go to Joshua Tree National Park now that it's open. <laughs> Yay. Yeah, and survey the our, damage. Our all-stars party is uh, this June, and you need to go online to register. It's going to be me. It's going to be you, Fraser. It's going to be Pamela. It's going to be Skylius. It's going to be John Michael Godia having tons of fun in the desert, stargazing, doing talks, doing demos, all sorts of cool stuff. Go to astrotours.co. Morgan. A couple weeks ago, I mentioned that I was going to be tweeting out a few pictures of cool old space things. And I actually did that. I went on my Twitter at Morgan Renberg and was tweeting out pictures of some artifacts I was working with as I put together an exhibit about uh, the Apollo mission. So I got a little piece of the Apollo 11 command module and some of the uh, stuff worn by by astronauts and windows from the space station and just really fun stuff that I got to to look at and, and work with uh, and, and wanted to take a chance to share. So like, are these artifacts that you guys just have in the museum and you bring them out 
for showing this off? Or do you did you actually get a special delivery of exciting stuff? Now, these are things that are either on extended loan or in our permanent collection. Uh, Alan Bean, who was the fourth man to walk on the moon, was from Fort Worth. And he donated, like most Apollo astronauts did, m many bits of memorabilia uh, after his, his career is over. And I'm going through and curating the best bits uh, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Apollo landings that start this summer. So I'm just, uh, I'll show you the, the screen. So I'm just showing people some of the stuff that you have there. So for example, micrometeorite impacts on Skylab. Yeah, so that was one of, one of the two windows mounted in the command module that carried the crew of Skylab 3 to space and then stayed docked with Skylab uh, for two months while that crew was working. And then when they came back, they took the window off and examined it microscopically to look for bits of space dust that were impacting the window to try to understand the energies and rates at which. And so if you, if you zoom in, like I did on the picture on the right, they have all these little circles on the window marking <laughs> little divots where the microscopes picked up uh, micrometeoroid impacts. Oh, that's amazing. Look at all this stuff. That is so exciting. Very cool. Uh, it's got to be like, like, do you have like this big hidden collection of of material that you just get to go in and go like, oh, look at all this stuff. That's pretty great. Uh, yeah, you got to have a reason to look at it. But <laughs> 50th anniversary of walking on the moon is a pretty good reason. Uh, and, you know, this is just like this stuff's a great part of history. Uh, and and it's great for people to be able to get a chance to see it. And so that'll be appearing in the, in the coming months. And I had a, a tremendously fun time looking at it and taking pictures. Mm. Oh, that's whatnot. fantastic. Uh, so I've got a couple of things. Uh, I, if I seem surprisingly knowledgeable of the topics at hand this week was because I did videos on both of them. So um, uh, later on this week, I'm gonna have my video on the earth rock found on the on the moon and next week i've got an episode about this uh this dark energy discovery so uh so stay tuned for those on my youtube channel um all right broad will you get the last word uh since you stuck around uh again to let people know uh you know we've talked about your book space 2.0 uh is there anything else interesting that you uh, worked on recently that people should come and check out uh, I've got a, a two more books coming out besides the one we talked about in 2018. One is uh, the Apollo 11 50th anniversary book. Good timing. Coming out from Sterling. And then a couple months after that, Heroes of the Space Age coming out from Prometheus. And then, as I mentioned, I edit Ad Astra magazine. So here's an ad for that. And I've got a 50th anniversary issue coming up in a couple of months on Apollo 11. And we're going to go public with that one. So I'm very excited about that. Well, Rod, it was an absolute pleasure having you on the show, and uh, clearly we're going to have to have you come back and talk about each one of these books as they happen every three weeks or so. So, uh, I can't wait to have can't wait to have you back. All right, so uh, for myself, my co-host, uh, our special guest, I want to again thank everyone for watching, and a big thanks of, as always to our good friends of the Weekly Space Hangout Crew. Go to wshcrew.space, and you can uh, join them and be part of the chat that's down at the bottom and just the great community. Now I'm gonna put everyone on screen so we can see us all and we're all gonna say goodbye. Goodbye, no. thanks everybody. Whoa, that's in a little too <laughs> many. But yeah, there you go. All right, thanks everybody, we'll see you next week. Thanks, take care. Bye.